Okay, so we're going to get going here. Um, we have uh, a significant amount of additional material. We're still going to plow through and, and cover um, with some exciting stuff uh, still to come. I wanted to give a brief, a brief uh, glimpse of uh, a what I would call sort of a, a pilot study we did, or 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 as a prototype study. Um, uh, that we did over the summer in response to a challenge problem that came out of uh, SBP, the SBP Brims Conference, which is a great conference for the sort of work we're talking about this week. Um, combines a lot of discussion of data science, a lot of discussion of system science, um, and the occasional people providing some of, of both. This work uh, was in response to a data challenge which focused on, on opioid-related burden in the U.S., in particular in Cincinnati. Um, and uh, we were posed, and, and other participants were posed, as part of this challenge to make use of data sets that came from an open analytics excuse me, an open data initiative in the city of Cincinnati. The city of Cincinnati shared their records from police dispatches and from ambulance calls, EMT calls, um, which were highly specific. I was actually kind of shocked. I mean, they, they specified the geo-coordinates of the response locations and so on, and the nature of the response. And a lot of those responses were things such as drug activity, heroin overdoses, or it would just say heroin sometimes, et cetera. This is provided for thousands of records, maybe tens of thousands now. It is added to daily and through the city of Cincinnati. And it is uh, a, a very impressive volume of information. So the participants in this data challenge for SBP BRIMS, this uh, wonderful conference on socio-behavioral prediction and modeling that is held yearly, um, they asked us, do with you, you know, take this data and do something with it that could help shed light on the, the situation in Cincinnati and inform policy choice or inform intervention choice for, for that city. Tell me I'm talking too much? No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's just there's a real hubbub from up there. Oh, it's yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we decided to use this challenge to explore some avenues associated with modeling um, using the types of techniques we talked about this week, the food camp, and it's still really loud. Um, and specifically, we thought that we'd try to use the particle MCMC, MCMC approach with this model. Um, just a bit of background. Um, many of those in the room will be familiar with the fact that um, uh, the drug overdoses have grown grievously within the US within the past decade or two. Um, and uh, drug overdoses from opioids have been a particularly large part of this burden. Uh, throughout the, the U.S. Um, this continually rising rate suggests a, a uh, inadequacy on the part of public health strategies to contain opioid abuse effectively. Um, and in recent years, models have been advanced, several of them. Um, a set of models that Narges is, uh, has been conducting an impressive uh, review of very systematically throughout the literature for, um, uh, for uh, conceptualizing, um, helping to understand, and in some case, 
helping to give suggestions for managing um, the burden of SD of, of, of opioid abuse. Many of these models have been a system dynamics models in character, um, dealing with the system as a whole from a population level rather than agent based level. But but these models suffer from what topics we've discussed in the course of the week. Rapid op obsolescence, once built, they grow increasingly disconnected with the current situation in the world. They fail to benefit from new information that's come in. And um, more than that, often they depict areas of a system which, for which there's uh, very little empirical data directly uh, with respect to it. Machine learning algorithms, um, such as we've talked about this week, uh, particularly uh, techniques such as particle filter, particle MCMC, have made it much easier to incorporate data into dynamic models and uh, support learning by these models. Learning in a way that illumines the underlying state of the situation and that can help us more than that uh, form a solid foundation based on understanding the full latent state to project forward and to ask what if questions. So the objective of this study was to provide a framework, an exploratory framework. This was a very rapidly conducted work. Um, poor Cheyenne, I think, had to sleep a few times in the lab on the couch. Um, um, you know, she was a period of very intensive work to pull this together following the, following the um, finishing of classes um, and, and the deadline that this conference had. Um, and the goal was to provide a uh, um, sort of exploratory framework to inform policy discourse, uh, discussion of interventions, addressing the key needs of opioid abuse, and to, and to uh, understand the patterns of opioid abuse as they likely manifest within the city of Cincinnati. Um, because of the market data gaps, particularly around illegal trade in, in, um, uh, in opioids, um, a portion of the system that simultaneously is very poorly known, but at the same time grievously responsible for a large number of, of, of overdose deaths, uh, illegally sourced opioids, opioids from dealers, which are poorly controlled and often going to individuals whose tolerance may have waned because of the vagaries of when they can get them or because they've ceased um, um, uh, over, oversight uh, medically for administering them. Market gaps um, in terms of data, we seek to apply a method that will allow for estimating poorly understood areas of the system, and it will integrate a, a wide variety of empirical data um, that might shed light on this, um, on these traditional gaps. Given the rapidly changing nature of the opioid em epidemic, we sought to create a model that learns from and adapts to incoming data and stays current with that latest data. Uh, Lugia was part of this. And the hope was that the sort of models we build here could be hitched up to the type of system that he demonstrated a day or two ago, in which data comes into the model and is used to reground it on a constant basis to keep that model current. Um, and where possible, based on studies conducted by Anahita and others, we sought to use high velocity data sources that would especially inform the model. Some of what her work found previously was that if you double the frequency of the data source for the model she was looking at, it, halved, it, it, it lowered the error by more than a factor of two. So you might get a factor of four lowering of the, of the um, error in model predictions by doubling the, the frequency of data collection. It, it suggested a premium on rapidly updating data sources, even where the, the, the quality of the data source was, was limited. We have a need to anticipate coming trends. Uh, opioid abuse is a scourge that is marked not only by its burden, but by its very rapidly evolving character. And few of my students, including those present, are aware that um, I first got involved in seeking to understand, to collect data online to probe the burden of opioid abuse uh, nearly 20 years ago during the initial opioid epidemic 
uh, associated with OxyContin abuse. And uh, in that context, I mind online data sources, um, internet chat forums, Usenet posts, but I also looked at corporate uh, databases that are Purdue Pharma, uh, the, the creator of OxyContin, to, anticipate, to, to understand some of the patterns of abuse there. Now, um, one of the biggest features that has been marked, the, uh, the evolution of these epidemics since then, is its very rapidly changing character, a very unpredictable character. The nature of the opioid burden has evolved rapidly with the introduction of new, particularly synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl, carfentanyl, and, uh, and synthetic opioids, which are being innovated on an ongoing basis. Um, but also has seen transitions from, uh, from heroin and from Oxycontin and Percocet and Oxycodone, et cetera. Um, as different agents come out, by which individuals seek to, um, uh, seek to manage pain, perhaps, and grow addicted, or where recreational users get hooked through exposure. The nature of the substances have evolved markedly, and the nature of the addictions have evolved with them. The nature of what it means to be addicted to opioids in today's society has evolved quite a lot over those past 20 years. As, as these, um, uh, these different sources have evolved, the, the emergence of mail order um, substances, uh, pill presses, etc. So we were seeking and anticipating coming trends to, to be responsive to the very fast-paced fast evolution of the epidemic. And then to evaluate policy scenarios, we sought to make use of a dynamic model capable of running what-if scenarios um, going forward. The model that we created was honed over time. Um, it did depict individuals at, um, who, in distinguished individuals who suffered from chronic pain versus those who, who sought uh, recreational use. Um, it distinguished those sourcing opioids from dealers as compared from those who were getting prescription opioids. It distinguished individuals under treatment and those individuals who are never users as well as those who had past disorders and, uh, uh, and uh, were now clean, as, as it was said. Um, what we're not showing here in this division um, is stratification by three very important subscripts. So you can think of this model as having layers that go back into the board. Layers, different layers associated with opioid tolerance level. We track the fact that an, over, an individual over time would develop varying tolerance because this was a key explanatory factor for several, several features of the situation. One of them, it related to risk of overdose deaths. And overdoses and deaths because an individual with waning tolerance who took a strength of opioid um, you know whether it's in the form of many uh, prescription pills or whether it's in the form of illegally sourced opioids if an individual with waning tolerance was exposed to a dose that they used to be able to take on a routine basis when they had higher tolerance um, uh, it's it can lead to death it can lead to overdoses um, and this is a familiar phenomenon uh, that people's, uh, people's level of tolerance wanes over time. There's dynamics associated with it, often when discontinuing treatment or due to erratic availability of, of medications from dealers. Another reason is that dealers have highly variable dosages. Um, uh, some of these pill pressers are, are creating opioids, um, uh, uh, synthetic opioids, into, uh, into ingestible substances using very amateurish me mechanisms that are very poorly controlled. And tolerance forms an important mediator as to how big a, um, how, how disastrous that will be for an individual. 
Another thing is that exposure over time to successively uh, to, to successive uh, prescriptions will build up tolerance in a way that will require more prescriptions yet and will invite physical dependence if not always mental dependence or if not always a disorder that results. And individuals who are in this prescription state escalate slowly in terms of, of tolerance. We also stratified by chronic pain status, whether an individual had chronic pain or not, and uh, whether they had a history of past disorder as an important, um, important consideration. I've spoken to you folks about particle filtering. I don't need to provide you a, a detailed um, um, overview of that technique again, but basically in particle filtering, we have these different particles, each of which has a different hypothesis about what's going on in the underlying system, what's going on in terms of how many people are in each of these states, um, according to all the subscripts at a given time. And those hypotheses evolve with the logic of the model and with new incoming data uh, by which the survival of the fittest takes place so that particles that are most consistent with the data, those hypotheses that jive best with what's observed in the world, survive and flourish and are well represented in the model. And those that, that uh, are not consistent with the data tend to die out over time. Their weights are reduced and eventually they'll typically die out due to resampling. Now one of the key factors that we brought to the table with this model that distinguished it was the fact that the model leveraged data from different sources, from different types of sources related to a broad set of different elements of the model. We were limited by what data we could find online, and we made use of it catch as catch cam. So what had been provided to us was very, very basic, and it's shown over here in the lower right. Police calls for service-related drug complaints and EMS responses. And these two sources captured critically information about overdose responses, but also about uses of, of, of uh, opioids, uh, particularly uh, heroin um, and, and, and drug-related calls. But beyond that, we further had data from Hamilton County, the, the surrounding county, um, drug overdose death. So not just occurrence of overdoses as intercepted by the police or by EMS. Um, we had county reports on opioid prescriptions as reported by the Ohio Board of Pharmacy. Um, and then we had a lesser vintage but still, still um, insightful Google trend data related to dark web people searching for drug rehab related factors, back pain, presumably related to, uh, uh, to chronic pain and chronic pain exposure, and uh, naloxone, an, an opioid antagonist um, that can provide a, uh, a life-saving um, life support during an opioid overdose. Now, what was notable is that this data related to different, to different sub-pieces of the model. Looking at this, I actually don't think that, um, uh, that these arrows necessarily, no, the arrows do not necessarily relate to where that data went in the model. I was going, I was initially thinking, okay, no. That, so this data relates to very different parts of the model, like drug rehab, relates to factors related to treatment, for example. Um, back pain relates to things related to chronic pain. Um, dark web seeking relates to dealer, uh, dealer seeking. Uh, naloxone relates to concerns about opioid overdoses, and I think uh, uh, relates to the occurrence uh, of those overdoses recently. Um, 
uh, so related to deaths from opioids. Um, overdose deaths uh, relate to that area. Uh, opioid prescriptions relate to this area. Um, drug, uh, sort of drug overdoses also relate up there to occurrence, not just deaths, et cetera. So a large amount of empirical data was leveraged uh, for this. And I actually can't believe how much was accomplished by the team working on it. Chaoyang and, and Lu Jie, I want to single out for their absolutely incredible devotion to this. In Lu Jie's case, um, much of it undertaken from overseas, um, running, running models um, uh, whilst he, uh, he uh, shortly after a wedding and, and um, as he was preparing to come back. Absolutely incredible progress. I could never <laughs> imagine this would have come together this quickly. Um, but by the dint of unstinting work, the students, the students were able to, to pull this off. Um, now, uh, we made use of negative binomial likelihood functions for many of these, where we had certain risks of, of exposure. Um, there was actually different cases, as I recall, related to the nature of the data but many of them relied on this form that you've seen before. And this gave us a kind of three-dimensional picture of the sort that I argued about before. This sort of data relating to different pieces of the model got knitted together, together into a picture of the system that was, uh, was insightful in my perspective. It uh, had uncertainties associated with it, but it sure illumined the different areas of the system. And fundamentally, there were a set of scenarios run prior to the uh, deadline for the challenge. <laughs> Those were quite some of the days. Um, so some scenarios were related to sort of um, calibration of the model and assessment of the model. Um, some were related to projection forward, given sort of status quo, what's likely to, to play out. Um, and some, there was sort of a, a very proof of concept, <coughs> simple intervention mechanism that was put into a place to show how this model could capture different interventions. Um, so these are some of the graphs that came out of the, of the study. Um, so uh, over time, we had data on overdoses, of course, um, that came from the police data, but that wouldn't have been all overdoses. And of course, the model depicted a broader set of, of opi uh, opioid overdoses associated with it than might be picked up in the police data. And so we were estimating the underlying number of overdoses, but we were trying to match the empirical data we did have, which was for a certain subcomponent of that. And um, the model evinced by the logic of the entire model, <laughs> some confidence as to where the, the mean was. I believe this is the mean shown in black uh, or median. Uh, I can't remember which it was shown. Oh, this is the empirical data. Oh, this is the empirical data. Yeah. Ah, ah, okay. I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the empirical data set here. Um, uh, we had drug activity. Um, and drug activity was related to the police and uh, I think it was predominantly police uh, police data. And the model was seeking to match, uh, to match that. Uh, this was a case which didn't match as well, although subsequent to publication, actually prior to publication, we had some scenarios which matched this better. And then after <laughs> publication, I think we realized how to match this better with some tuning of the model as well. This was just the one actually submitted um, but we, we were able to find a theory that accounted for this fraction of population under opioid prescription. And opioid deaths, this is one where we, we needed further, uh, further work. Back pain, we couldn't account for the patterns seen. Um, these are individual searches for back pain over time. Um, we didn't do a very good, good job uh, capturing the trend, but we were able to capture basic elements Drug rehab, the model gave a high, high posterior density 
estimate that are somewhat close to the data, but it was quite uncertain about what the underlying use of drug rehab was. Um, and naloxone searches were anticipated to be in this range, which is not too far off, and then drug we uh, dark web activity and what it anticipated for drug web searches were, were fairly, uh, fairly uh, consistent with that evidence. Rem reminding you that it was regrounding it in data over time as data came in. So it's to be expected that if the model captures a plausible theory, it will hopefully hug these curves not too far out. And, and that's what it seemed to do. Um, uh, again, uh, with, with room to improve on this fraction of population under opioids that we, we pushed on. In terms of latent stocks, stocks where we didn't have observed data to ground it, I argued in this very room and from this very pulpit that, that um, what we do have empirically allows us to shed light on, illuminate uh, what is going on in other areas of the model. And this includes latent stocks. Um, uh, and here we had pictures come out of it that were provocative, if not always uh, completely, uh, uh, completely um, uh, clear in their implications. Um, so latent stocks, four of them happen to be shown here, although there's, uh, as I recall, a, a much larger set of latent stocks overall on the model where there's not specifically data for them. Um, uh, so this is um, opioid. So this is opioids from dealers. Uh, so so this is for individuals I think with chronic pain and low tolerance. And some of the reasons it may go down is people developing tolerance, for example. Um, but this rise I think is seen as posited to be due to larger amounts of um, of, of uh, individuals uh, engaging in abuse, I believe. I'd have to uh, double check that. Um, here we have uh, drug dealers sourced. Uh, so this is overdose hazard rate from drug dealers. Um, uh, this is prescriptions um, uh, for ever disordered individuals with chronic pain and, and low tolerance. And you see, again, considerable dynamics, which I think should take study. These initial dynamics I'm not clear about the degree to which they resulted from a model that was initially out of balance or to what degree it's actually likely to be a substantive dynamics implied by the, the um, time series. I suspect the model may have been out of balance initially and we'll have, to, we'll have to look at that more closely before we seek to advance this work. And then uh, dealer source change. Is this, um, do you remember Shayan? was this uh, to, to switch two dealers from prescription? Yes. Yeah. Um, and what you see here posited is a growing use of, pers of, of sourcing of opioids from dealers rather than from prescription sources that actually relates to this decreasing number of, of individuals who are under uh, opioid prescriptions with doctors becoming more tight in their prescribing and individuals potentially, what this posits is individuals turning to dealers as a sourcing mechanism and indeed turning to the, uh, to the dark web um, as, a, uh, as a source for um, prescription, uh, for, for, um, for opioids. MCMC parameters uh, were, were um, we sought to assess these. These are just a trace plot, meaning over time, it was sampling from these. There'd be a, a, a histogram implied, sort of over the, the sphere here, where those that are most common will be a peak in it. We haven't happened to have shown this in this presentation. Now, we sought then to use this model to predict as part of this challenge. Um, so here, uh, we sought to use the model status quo to predict forward what's likely happen with no new incoming data coming in. So after this, this dotted line, Cheyenne cut off the data. And after this, we sought to predict. And you can see the model becomes uncertain, but 
I don't know if you could see it from where you are, but there's this brown band here, which reflects its higher probability density region, the area where it thinks it's most likely to put, its, put down its money, so to speak. And you can see it actually follows this data quite, quite precisely um, in terms of that, I mean, very, very effectively. The same thing for overdose uh, uh, counts here. It, it has some potential that they would really rise, but it suspects they're most likely uh, within this area. And then the fraction of patients uh, under the prescription system here um, also uh, being anticipated. This data is shown here for comparison, but it's not used by the model. Um, it's, uh, it's being matched by the model. Um, now, we also looked at some interventions. Just, it was a proof of concept, as was noted. The idea is, could this model reasonably capture the effects of, of interventions? And it was a simple intervention. Um, I actually don't remember exactly which parameters were, were changed. Shao so, yeah, do you remember? Oh, just the Allen stock, actually. Oh, it was the Allen stock? Yeah, the stock was probably, yeah. Yeah. So, so the individuals were entered in the McLeanian program? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, this, model's, this model came originally out of a hackathon on the opioid area, which took place in April. The original structure with uh, Xiao Yan and Yuan and, and Anahita jointly working on it. What a power team, right? <laughs> right, Christine? Yeah. Um, and they came up with the basic structure of the model with an idea towards using it with PMCMC. And, and then it went forward under uh, Xiao Yan's uh, leadership um, at sort of warp speed to, to deliver on the challenge. Again, I can't believe this was done. Um, you would not believe the C code I mean, <laughs> that she had to write um, to do this. It's very impressive. Now, um, there was a stock Alan provided during the hackathon. Alan, who used to be a uh, community outreach worker as a nurse in the downtown east side of Vancouver, an area very hard hit by opioid overdoses and by drug use activity, provided some guidance to us on an understanding of the epidemiology and the social behavioral components associated with opioid abuse. And it was actually quite helpful. And that, that supplemented some of the learning uh, that I had gotten from talking with Narges from the literature and uh, from talking with Peter Butt, who's uh, the, uh, uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan's key key uh, advisor for uh, opioid-related disorder and, and abuse. And one of the things that Alan suggested was exploring a type of intervention which is being used in British Columbia, BC, to, to lower the burden of opioid overdose deaths. And this, consi this involves, very importantly, trying to stabilize people's lives um, it, it, sort of it's a whole person approach, but which also involves medically supervised administration of opioids to individuals on a daily basis whilst they're, they're given, uh, they're provided with jobs and stable homes, I believe stable housing, etc. And it's been highly successful. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a key element of it which does involve daily administration of opioids. And it's interesting because uh, some that I've talked to it who have some familiarity with the opioid area have been surprised that individuals who, are, who undergo daily administration through intravenous means of, of opioids are able to hold down jobs, but they are. They're, they're actually hold down functional jobs. Um, and, uh, and individuals within the stock are therefore at low risk of relapse to dealer sourcing because they're getting a source of opioids daily. The, the, the withdrawal cravings and, and elements that, that would typically come in are, are, are minimized. Um, they are very functional and not nearly as likely to be disordered in their life with the stabilization that occurs. And more than that, those individuals um, are at very low risk of death because they're getting very 
you know, medically, uh, and medical, medically um, supervised dosing levels that are very well controlled and that are appropriate for their level of tolerance. Uh, my understanding is that this is a longer program where they're not actually slowly titrating it and, and walking it down. There's many other programs where that's been the primary mechanism. They sort of walk down the dosing over time, but often the issue there is that individuals drop out of the program and, and seek, uh, seek uh, uh, opioids separately. So this was a program that, that got the name sort of the Allen program, or Allen stock, right? Um, that, that's what that uh, represented. Um, and so we put in place the Allen stock um, and, uh, and sought to examine um, impact on overdoses, impact on, on death. This is without the intervention till, um, and it, the intervention starts at time 80, which is about here, and you see a rising toll of deaths. Uh, here, this is, uh, this is the accumulated death with the intervention. You see it, you see it stabilize, it remains at fairly high levels. Not everyone is in that um, Allen stock of, 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 of uh, rest. Um, uh, but it, it does not escalate. Uh, oh, this is cumul This is cumulative. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, I misspeak. This is cumulative death. So this is deaths over time totaled up. And so the very fact that this plateaus or nearly plateaus, it rises slightly as an indication that deaths are occurring at vastly lower levels than they were when this was sloped upwards. The steepness of the slope denotes a rising toll of cumulative deaths uh, a, human, a human carnage that's been wreaked by opioids to this point. But then following this intervention, it rises at much slower rates. By contrast, over here, we have uh, a continuing um, toll of, of, of distressing proportions, distressing and growing proportions. So we see that the intervention as simulated seems to reduce over, uh, overdoses, not all of which are fatal, many of which are not, but overdose occurrence in which often have, they, they impose um, uh, great cost on uh, police and on an opportunity cost, but also cost as far as the medical system is concerned to stabilize these patients, to address uh, liver and kidney, uh, kidney issues that, that come from them, to stabilize them. Um, the number of overdoses dropped and the number of, of deaths uh, similarly dropped. So these were, this is a very exploratory model, um, but it is informed by data, and it's informed by data that relates to areas of the system where there's very little otherwise good understanding about what's likely to be going on. So, you know, overall findings from this work, very preliminary, um, but encouraging. Uh, PMCMC provides a promising means for creating these sort of self-learning models kept perpetually current by leveraging diverse incoming lines of data. Diverse here between, you know, open data from the city of, of, of Cincinnati on police calls, EMS responses, uh, many, many times a day to um, overdose deaths reported, I believe, maybe quarterly, we kept, actually it's something that's not in here. I don't know whither it went. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, oh, okay, uh, no, 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 no. There was, there was a CDC, maybe, oh, this is another source. I got, I got data on a very fine-grained basis, I think, from the CDC involving deaths from opioids according to the ICD-10 and 11 codes that I extracted from the CDC Wonder system. Um, it's called Wonder, CDC Wonder. It's, it's a system for, um, for uh, mortality data by county um, and, uh, and by ICD-11 code. And you can actually ask more detail, yeah. There's a, there's a whole swack of, of specifics. So I got that on a, I can't remember, I think it was monthly basis. Um, and, and, but there was some other data that, that accompanied, I think, from the county that was different uh, from the Ohio Department of Health. In any case, this, this type of data, particularly with the Google Trend data, 
um, really spans a broad area of the system. And, and we, we leverage that, whether it's daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly, it was leveraged. Um, we combine machine learning, high, high temporal density data, like this, this uh, search data, and dynamic modeling can allow for effective estimation of the latent as well as the observed system state. These types of models, PM, CMC, grounded models, can allow for projection forward based on understanding of that latent state. And PM, CMC methods allow for really assessing inter-intervention uh, trade-offs, although we don't really explore it here. This, this could be a valuable tool for uh, probing intervention their effects in, in different areas. With the extra grounding of the understanding of the, of the under, underlying system state, as informed by these multiple lines of data. Um, and certainly much more, uh, much additional technical investigation, parallelization to fully exploit the potential of these methods. And certainly this model, um, the data that goes into it, and the, um, the, the elements of the, uh, the method that support it could be much refined in a future evolution of this work. So that's a little bit of, um, of explanation for this, for this very fast-paced project. I think um, the deadline for this was June, right? Um, uh, end of June, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, the project was begun, it, was, it came out of the boot camp, I think, in mid-April. So it was a very rapid rush to deliver on it. Okay, um, any questions about this little case study I could help uh, address? You have uh, data coming in, and you can have the model will adjust. The what? So as you get new data in, the model can like adjust. Yes. But uh -huh. I guess one of, the, like, one of the issues now with opioids is that some users are moving Yes. Like, that wouldn't be captured in this model unless you specifically... No. Um, I, should, I should clarify that the data we got from the CDC, um, as I recall it, it was opioid. I remember very specifically looking for ICD-11 codes associated with opioid-related poisonings. And um, so if an individual, let's say, switched to crystal meth and overdosed on that or, or you know, had, had a, uh, uh, a, a fatal ingestion, that wouldn't have been captured in our data and it would have, it would have uh, left to individuals who basically left opioid use um, and came clean as far as opioids are concerned, but, you know, were engaged in, in crystal meth approach, or, or abuse, rather. Um, uh, so, so you're right, you're absolutely right that that wouldn't have been caught, nor, nor does this model, very importantly for the Canadian context, nor does it seek to capture um, the interaction, say, of, uh, of cannabis um, and, uh, and opioids, which for, for Cincinnati is probably not as central an issue as it would be for Canada, because cannabis can serve simultaneously as an alternative pain management strategy, uh, but also as a strategy for lessening withdrawal symptoms from, um, uh, from, from opioids. Um, and, uh, and as such, um, the legalization that has, has taken place just within this past month, um, you know, within the past 30 days, is, is something of, uh, of you know, great significance. But, uh, we don't seek to capture that there. And, and this is a very interesting question because there's a strong case to be made that, um, that uh, there's an entanglement between types of drug use. And crystal meth is not in its own world from opioids. You get a fair number of dysphoric individuals who might cross over between them. And, um, you know, there, I think there's an interesting question as to what would, if, if a lot would be added by 
having a representation of other drug use. Um, but I think at the least what's needed is to recognize that contrary to the name, and I think per your suggestion, this needs to be improved. This is actually, uh, we should be cautious about saying it's clean past user because this individual may not be clean in the sense of being free from drugs. It may be that they switched um, quit, switch substance uses. Yeah. So, so I like that idea a lot. We did have, so we explored, and I can't remember where this came out in the final model, um, but we explored a situation where the perceptions of opioid riskiness was affected by the cumulative number of deaths from opioids. And the idea the idea shaping this was um, maybe as, just like with HIV, as the number of HIV cases rose and people realized this is a death sentence you know, in the 1980s, um, it, it ended up changing patterns of risk behavior on the part of, of populations that otherwise might have had high risk of, of infection. And that, that uh, in the US, that really blunted some of the growth of HIV, although it still did grievous, grievous damage. Um, it, it led to material changes in risk patterns, which actually ended up affecting STIs, et cetera. Here, there's an interesting question as to whether people's perceptions associated with opioids might reduce their use of opioids in terms of prescription, either the doctor prescribing them or the patients accepting them. The, the, the seeking out of dealers for use for recreational purposes and the likelihood of overdoses uh, on the part of individuals. Um, uh, I think that growing number may have factored into, the growing number of deaths might have factored into searches for naloxone. I, I can't remember that with, with certainty, but yeah, yeah, Leanne. I was going to say Oh, I see. So I, I, I really appreciate that insight. And unfortunately, there is evidence which Alan brought to us to, to, to that, that this is indeed an operative effect within Canada. So he had mentioned. And, and this boggles the mind, but I'll pass it on. An anecdote along these lines with, um, he said that, that in terms of EMS responses and police responses, um, that there's a very material burden of opioids and in terms of dispatch calls in some jurisdictions. And he mentioned a case in Vancouver, which a case of one individual in Vancouver, <laughs> that sounded horrible. Um, but one individual in Vancouver who in the course of 24 hours had 25 overdoses and the, the, each time there was a dispatch call, they came to the house, they administered him Narcan and he, he came to and uh, Alan was describing the fact that I guess wh when that's administered, it, it sort of neutralizes the, the, the opioids in your system. And so a lot of the users then feel craving for opioids. And so the Narcan dispensers, the, the, the emergency response left. And within you know, minutes, um, he was back preparing opioids to take. Because he felt so bad. Because he felt so bad. And they came back the next hour. And they came back the next hour. More than once an hour, they were coming back and just administering naloxone. And, and I think this is further to your point that um, uh, that number one, I mean, I, I guess it's multifaceted, isn't it? Because there's the effects of administration on craving and, and reuse, but then there's also the effects on risk perception. And, you know, is this a death sentence to fool around with opioids? Well, maybe not. You know, we have Narcan now, and one of my buddies will give it to me if, if, if I'm too close to the edge. So you're right, and that's a very perceptive comment that um, 
I, I don't remember actually building it, building into this current model and maybe needs to be associated with risk behaviors, risk of overdoses associated particularly with this, uh, this dealer, uh, dealer stock. So I like that comment very much. Thank you. And it's something we could seek to address uh, within a model like this. I, I mean, the other side of that mm. is, and I don't know, this is something someone told me once, so I don't know if I can see. Um, I, I think it was uh, someone from the Penn's Clinic uh, Commission who said, you know, takes an average of a couple times, uh, eight times, relapse by eight times before you actually actually continue to work. So, so, wow. you, so you may go through rehab like eight times before you can work, actually, on average. Mm -hmm. and which to me was stunning because that's a huge amount of, uh, it just, it, it, the, the, the burden on everybody, if yeah. somebody has to take that one to recover this problem. But, but on the other hand, if, if, if as a result of, because it's that many times, if, if and our can keeps you alive so that you can right. hopefully then go through rehab and maybe one of those times it'll stick, right. maybe that's the other way to it. Right, right, and, and that's what I was thinking. I mean, it, it, it may be that we're preventing some people from dying that otherwise would, and, and maybe they'll eventually make their way to treatment, yeah. to, to, a, to a treatment that sticks. Yeah. To a, a treatment, or to treatment that, yeah, that, that gets them out of, of their, uh, you know, of, of their adverse um, sort of vicious cycle of, of, of falling back uh, into it. Um, so, so very, very insightful point, and um, one that you know could be could could be strengthened in terms of this, in terms of capturing that that treatment cycle, and the fact that many iterations are probably required. Um, a, a system dynamics model wouldn't be my uh, most preferred method for describing it, but could be used. An agent-based model would be more powerful, more powerful yet. Yeah. It seems rather really sad that they would have to come 25 times, you yeah. know, because, yeah. uh, you know, at a, I guess we can't force somebody to go into treatment, but at a certain point, you have to put that in mm -hmm. themselves, right? yeah. doing harm to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true, that does not sound like a sane situation. And, you know, for, and it doesn't sound like it benefits anyone, so, you know. Um, uh, imagine if one of those times they were delayed by anything from traffic to another urgent incident, and, and you know, an urgent uh, incident, and, and that person might die. You know, um, they're counting on them to be, to, to, to be there for them. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Other other comments, questions. Okay. Um, thank you uh, very much for. Uh,